Throughout the course of human history, especially before the Industrial Revolution changed uh, the way we live and eat, our species ate around 10,000 different plants and animals. Today, this number is around 150. Diversity is resiliency. It's a message that applies to human cultures, natural ecosystems, and even the microorganisms in our bodies. And where can we find the most culinary and nutritional diversity? Not in the food we eat today, and not probably not in the future one too. We have to look in the food of the past, to the huge variety of foods we've eaten throughout the course of our species existence. Good food, good meat, good cheese is worth fighting for. Let's um, dive into today's archaeogastronomical adventure. Hello! Welcome back to another episode of the Delicious Legacy Podcast. I'm your host, Thomas Dinas, and on today's episode, we have another fantastic interview with an exciting guest. Remember, this podcast can only exist with your generous support. Go to Patreon and check the different uh, tires. If you find something that interests you, please, uh, please support us there. Montreal, what a great city. Have you ever been? Yes, it's freezing in the winter, but that's Canada for you. But it's a foodie's paradise. Anyway, this isn't an episode about the food of Montreal, but a resident author and journalist of Montreal, an adopted son of the city, who came on my radar a couple of years back on Twitter or what we used to call Twitter, R.I.P. Taras Gresko, for that is his name, was posting about his experiments with garum and other long-lost ingredients, writing beautifully as well about secret Canadian food lovers' paradisical places. Well, I knew even back then, straight away, he would be a great person to be on the podcast in the future, for one reason or another. So a few months ago, it was clear that he was writing a book called The Lost Supper, searching for the future of food in the flavors of the past. And this intrigued me straight away. I knew I wanted to get him on the podcast and talk about the book as soon as this was humanely possible. I was lucky to receive an advanced copy a few months before the release and sat down devouring it eagerly and repeatedly over the following weeks. Earlier this month, just after the release of the book in North America, I managed to speak with Taras online and chat with him about some of the thought-provoking lost foods in his book. What does this mean for us today, our diet and nutrition, and our future as a species? I caught up with Taras in the midst of his uh, Canadian tour online, and this proved uh, challenging in terms of the quality of the connection. In a lot of places, the sound isn't ideal, I'm afraid, and I can only apologize to you. But please bear with it, only for a few seconds, as most of the interview sounds fine. On the show notes, I will provide a text transcription of the said passages that don't sound great, with uh, the time code as well, so you can refer to those if you can't make up what we're talking about. Taras was also exhausted and his voice broken for many days on the road, and I can only thank him from the bottom of my heart, making time to chat with me on that morning. Please enjoy this fascinating chat and go buy his book. Our virtual adventure takes us from the semi-arid plateaus of Anatolia in central Turkey to the wild west coast of Canada via Puglia and Cadith. And some of the central messages are that if we want to save something from extinction, we got to eat it. And in diversity, there is resilience. Messages that, if nothing else, they can provide food for thought, pardon the pun, of course, about humanity's quest to feed itself in an ethical and environmentally friendly way. And now, let's go to our interview. Enjoy! Taras, welcome to the Delicious Legacy Podcast. It's great to be here, Thomas. I'm a big fan. Thank you. For those that don't know you, tell us a little bit about about yourself and about your previous work as well. 
Yeah, I'm a nonfiction writer, a journalist. Uh, this is my eighth book. I live in Canada, in the great city of Montreal, the great food city of Montreal. And uh, I've, most of my books involve some kind of travel. Um, I often comment on the environment. And I'm really interested in our relationship as a species with the food that we eat. I wrote a, a book uh, that was published in the UK called bottom feeder it was called uh, the dead seas in the uk and it was all about uh how we are draining the oceans of fish through the, our consumption of seafood so i'm a food lover uh, i uh, i i adore intense flavors but i also aspire to be an ethical epicurean somebody who thinks hard about where the food that he or she or they eat comes from Mm, absolutely. I mean, I agree with you. And um, it's hard not to be that kind of person, like a hard thinking Epicurean and um, ethical one. If you delve into food world and you're trying to find out the history of stuff and how they're made and who's making it and yeah, <laughs> if you can feed people and the more you learn, the more you try to be as ethical as you can. I think yeah, and it's a it's a huge challenge. I mean, all the food we eat comes from somewhere, although many of us seem to have forgotten that. And uh, we're increasingly disconnected from the farmers, the fishers, and food producers. Um, so, the Lost Supper, my latest book, is a deep dive into the history of food, going back through our three hundred thousand plus years as a species. It especially focuses on you know what's happened since the Neolithic agricultural revolution. I, in nine chapters, I traveled the world seeking out, it's kind of a quest narrative, I'm, I'm seeking out lost and obscure foods, and uh, bringing it all back to my home and my own kitchen, trying to figure out what I and my two children and my wife can eat uh, sustainably, but also with a, a deep desire to find what is delicious and explore the idea that deliciousness was a driving force in human evolution. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I find that quite um, interesting. I mean, the book um, itself is, um, I think the, the scope of the book is quite uh, grand in a way. Um, I, f I find the ideas behind each chapter and um, ve ve very thought provoking, basically. And, you know, it travels, it takes me to all these different places and all these different ways that we can, as humanity, as species, to find our food, consume it, and um, what can we do better, actually. But um, can you talk a little bit about um, um, why you chose these specific places that you went to? Uh, we can say, for example, you've been to Turkey to find um, Neolithic bread as such, our beginnings as uh, <laughs> uh, from hunter-gatherers to agriculturists, in a way. And um, then you went to Mexico City and so on and so on. So yeah, tell us a bit about this, um, why you chose these places. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was difficult. The whole idea was born in Greece uh, about eight years ago. I went to a vineyard in uh, north of Thessaloniki. I was visiting a, a winemaker's property, and he served us an amazing wine uh, that was made with a strange grape. It kind of looked like a Kalamata olive, mm -hmm. and it made this beautiful cranberry hued rosé with a very distinct taste, a lot of interesting tannins. He said the, the grape had been discovered by a shepherd. They did a DNA analysis of it and he claimed that it was a grape that was being consumed at you know, the time of Homer. I'm not sure about the authenticity of those claims, but that planted a seed in my mind that maybe we can reach out and taste the past. And I started to realize that there are a lot of uh, analytical techniques that will allow us to examine organic remains and revive some of these foods. So one of my first goals was to recreate garum. Mm. I understood that the, the amazing ancient fish sauce from Rome, a team in the south of Spain in Cadiz had been analyzing the organic remains from uh, Pompeii, from a place called the Bottega del Garum. And they were making their own fish sauce. They called it Flor de Guerra. So I went to Cadiz and uh, chefs there have been using this uh, fermented fish sauce in their cuisine and their cooking, making fantastic new dishes. So that was sort of the starting point of it. But I really wanted to tell the story of our relationship with 
food, the idea that we can go back into the past and look for the flavors of the past, um, because we're at a critical point in our relationship with food. There's a narrowing in the diversity of the foods that we eat. And uh, of course, our population is increasing. We're heading for, by some estimates, a population of 10 billion by mid-century. So I think that a lot of things are pointing towards a more technological future, a future that's even more divorced from food production. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to look from, you know, the, the, the traditional forms, the connection to the soil, the connection to the water and the oceans and the seas and the rivers. And I wanted to look at traditional practices and also these sort of emblematic foods. So as you mentioned, I began at a place called Chattel Hoyuk, which is famous uh, for being one of the largest Neolithic settlements in the world. My goal there was to see how they were making bread. And they were making bread, I discovered, from a grain called emmer, which was partly gathered and partly cultivated. And when I was there, I was really narrowly focused on get, on seeing you know, the grindstones that they had to grind the wheat, the form of the ovens, these clay ovens, which are similar to contemporary ovens called firins. And I uh, brought all that knowledge back to my home in Montreal and set about making my own Neolithic flatbread. That was my technique all <laughs> through the book. I was trying to find these things like garum and kind of get the recipes and yeah. then recreate them in my own kitchen. So garum was a really interesting example. Uh, obviously, people who listen to the podcast and me personally, you know, I've explored as much as I can the, um, the history of garum and how it was made. And I know about Sally Granger. And um, I guess you you met her a few times and you had a lot of advice from her on how to create more authentic garum and all the different sauces, liquame and muria and so on and so on. So, yeah, the garum bit, um, it was very intriguing. At the end of the day, did you find um, the garum that you made um, tasty and interesting and something that you can use it as a secret ingredient in foods? In your yeah, definitely. So my modus operandi was to go to Cadiz in the south of Spain, where they made a commercial version of it. Uh, uh, it's archaeologists and uh, food scientists at the University of Cadiz. But then I started uh, collaborating with Sally Granger, who I kind of think of as the Julia Child of uh, ancient cooking. <laughs> she's uh, she's wrote a fantastic book called The Story of Garum, which is the deepest dive you'll find into the subject. She advised me as I made my own garum, and the interesting thing is, of course, it's a pretty straightforward process. You allow, um, with salt, you allow small fish, in my case, Portuguese sardines, to liquefy. You have to keep them at a constant temperature in a sealed jar of about 30 degrees. It took three months. Mm. But at the end, I, I, had the, I had the liquid, and I've been using it in my kitchen. It's become sort of a secret ingredient in the <laughs> sauces I make uh, for my kids, or even French onion soup. It's like a, it adds this umami intensity, mm. which is different from other forms. You know, you can, you can very simply fry or saute anchovies in the pan that will add a certain amount to a sauce but this this is a very different taste it's a unifying ingredient it harmonizes a whole bunch of disparate ingredients really good with tomatoes for example in a tomato sauce the romans used it in almost anything it was basically their substitute for sauce i find it just you know anything savory a few drops of garum can enhance it so the first time i tried it i was quite worried there's a risk of botulism yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know the first spoonful i had poison control on speed dial but uh <laughs> sally sally talked me through the whole thing and it turned out pretty good pretty well interestingly enough she makes the case that there are commercial equivalents that are really quite good mm. like uh particularly Vietnamese Nguoc Mam, the better quality bottles are quite close in process to what Garum was. For me, though, it was just, you know, it's fascinating to dive into the history of the Roman Empire. I have a theory that the Romans were these agriculturalists who lived in, uh, especially in, in Rome, in these very 
citified, civilized environments. And I think their taste for Garen was kind of a way of connecting with the lost wilds, the mm-hmm. idea that they had uh, left behind, turned their back on nature and uh, the natural world. And, you know, this was a way of bringing intensity back to their diet. <laughs> it was also just fascinating to discover, you know, because I did a lot of cooking in correspondence with uh, Sally, who also does these great cookbooks of Roman cuisine. I started cooking Roman style. I assembled a pantry of ingredients, and it's, it's a fascinating cuisine. It's quite different from Italian, of course. They have yeah. no post-Columbian contact ingredients. And it's, it's a little more like Cantonese cooking, you know, mm. with a sweet and sour. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I wish chefs, more chefs would explore it because it's, you know, it's accessible to us. Another thing you explore a lot um, in your book, Another idea is also the idea of eating insects, entomophagy, and that uh, brought you to Mexico, to Mexico City. And um, also, you talked about uh, axaya cattle. Uh, so you can tell us a little bit about that, because this is something that I think most people won't uh, have heard before. Yeah, for sure. So I, I set out with you know, a few years ago, we were hearing the idea that we should be eating more insects. Edible insects are a fantastic source of protein, and we uh, we do well to include them in our diet, especially given the population pressures. So I was exploring that idea. I decided to go down to Mexico City. Mexico has a big tradition of going back thousands of years, according to the evidence in archaeological sites there, of uh, eating bugs. Now, I was searching for a wautli. Uh, that's the uh, Mexica or Aztec word for the eggs of water boatmen. They were crucial in the development of the Aztec empire, and they're still available in Mexico City. But along the way, I tried many other kinds of edible insects in Mexico City. Mm. And the interesting thing is that they are they are prized. They are the most expensive things on the menus of some of the top restaurants in the city. For example, I went to a restaurant called uh, Azul and uh, in, uh, where was it, La Condesa? And I had escamoles, which are the eggs of flying ants. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. So they're like these little tiny uh, white eggs. Actually, they're quite large for legs. So uh, eggs. And they kind of taste like baked beans with very thin skins. They fry them in butter with epazote, uh, which is a herb that's often used in beans. Um and uh, a little bit of onion and i mean they're exquisite and people who uh, older people in particular know that these things are 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 worth paying for that was the interesting thing for me because here in north america and and in canada and the united states edible insects are seen as kind of a novelty or you know something to dare people to try right there they're really part of uh, you know the sort of uh, upper level eating (laughs) How interesting. And also, I mean, there's a long tradition, I guess, in the whole of North America of eating um, insects, I suppose, or the things that we find a little bit uh, challenging. Um, yeah, so I, was, I wasn't I was making a question, but I was saying that the, the fact that entomophagy or insects um, was in the menu in many native communities across North America, I would, I would think so, native, native Americans. And whereas today it seems like something very novel and daring to do. And also insects were eaten and still are eaten in many parts of Africa as well. So it's it's not something that um, we can, we can um, completely exclude from our menu, I suppose, if we, <laughs> if we think about um, the environment. Insects uh, can be a part of the solution for humanity to solve some of the problems we have with... Um, with the with the carbon emissions and um, too much meat and health and so on and balance our diet a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm not so convinced of that. That's the thesis I wanted to explore in the book. Insects mm. are definitely a, uh, an important part of our diet. I mean, if you go back way back, 66 million years, mm-hmm. Purgatorius, one of our first mammalian ancestors, was an insect- insectivore, mm. um, and our hominem ancestors got a lot of the fat in their diet from edible insects. And of course, you know, our ape 
cousins uh, use tools to seek out things like termites. Yeah. And there's a lot of evidence that hunter-gatherers at certain times, uh, human hunter-gatherers, um, seek out insects because they are just so full of nutrition. But what I found is that edible insects are very expensive. Um, mm. It's, uh, as I mentioned, in Mexico City, they're quite costly. Even getting, there's a large cricket farm here, the world's largest cricket farm in uh, Canada, in the province of Ontario. I visited it with my son and got him to eat <laughs> some of the crickets there. But uh, they were, they, they remain very expensive. You're, you're dropping a lot of money. It's, it's more expensive than steak, frankly, for that kind of protein. Right. I think the real future of insects is as feed for livestock um, instead of, um, you know, netting fish in the ocean, small forage fish, which are um, fantastic as nutrition, nutrition for us, for we humans, we could be uh, feeding insects and particularly things like black soldier flies, which are, can be fed on like, you know, brewery waste. If we're, we could be feeding those using them as feed for the animals that we eat. Uh, that's an intel as a supplement, you know, to add yeah. protein. That yeah. makes a lot of sense to me. So mm. I, I think that you know it is kind of a novelty. It's an interesting uh, part of human development, but not necessarily the food of the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can help with other stuff in conjunction, and like use it as a feed to feed the animals that we eat as part of that solution. I'll be back after this short break. So, yeah, in your book, you take us uh, through many places around <laughs> the world and especially in Europe and the old world and so on, trying to find the origins of certain uh, foods. But um, you also take us to Canada in uh, Vancouver Island, where you grew up, I believe, right? I grew up in uh, in what's called, some people call it British Columbia. I prefer mm-hmm. to call it Ilihichuk, which is an indigenous term uh, from the Chinook jargon uh, for the same place it means where the land meets the sea um, and I grew up in Vancouver and you're right uh, one of the chapters takes place on Vancouver Island which is uh, an island the size of Taiwan off the coast of British Columbia or Ilihichuk. I was looking for a food called kamas and although I'd spent the first 25 years of my life Uh, in that part of the world. I'd never heard of it. Mm. And there's good reasons for that. It was apparently the most traded food on the Northwest coast after smoked salmon, a really important part of the diet. It's a lily root um, that grows under oak trees and it was cultivated by the Coast Salish people. And the Coast Salish, I mean, that part of the world is really fascinating. Um, Before contact with Europeans, it was the most highly settled part of North America north of the basin of Mexico, where Mexico City is now. Mm. Um, 200,000 people living there and thriving on a variety of plant foods. And of course, the aquatic resources, especially the, the salmon runs. So it was my goal to, to, to find this route and see if someone would offer me some hospitality. Um, it's an amazing food. It's a complex carbohydrate. It's got a lot of inulin in it. It is cooked in an earth oven. Um, or a pit cook and you uh, which you so you dig a pit in the ground you put seaweed down you put ferns down and you'll often bake clams and other shellfish in it um, for up to 48 hours and mm. this root gradually turns into this beautiful food which can have a texture like a baked pear it can be quite sweet or depending on the cooking somewhere between cauliflower and a potato after colonization by european settlers the connection to kamas uh, was broken basically the coast salish people weren't allowed on the land where they'd been cultivating it for a millennia um, and the potato kind of moved in and, uh, mm. and replaced it and things like bannock bread which is almost like a scottish uh, fry bread which is not really, they're not really good for your health, those things, whereas the kamas was excellent. There's one thing about the kamas that you have to be very careful. There are two kinds of kamas, blue kamas and uh, white kamas. And white kamas is also known as death kamas. <laughs> a single taste of it can like, send you, it can paralyze you. Um, so it's a, it, was, it, was a, it was a tricky bit of research. Yeah, I can't imagine, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, you managed it. You, you with us. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that part of the world seems very fascinating because um, there was such a rich uh, diet and rich uh, flora and fauna of uh, cultivated and semi-cultivated um, stuff. Uh, you know, sea gardens and clams and salmon and yeah. the, the orchards. It just feels like a another paradise ruined by the white man. <laughs> well, there were at least a hundred kinds of plants that were regularly used for food. And now if you go there, I mean, it's just part of the global standard diet. People are completely disconnected from it, but they're still surrounded. I mean, it's an amazing environment. And mm. if you know how to forage, you can find it. I can even, I've taken uh, my kids foraging outside of Montreal. Uh, of course, Canada is just a great source of these kind of foods. We can fi even find sumac here growing on the sides of rose, which can make uh, into a, f a fantastic spice mix, you know, oh, wow. zaatar and stuff like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, it's it's once you once you start to, you know, looking around, you realize ah, we live, we are surrounded by this edible wild. But my thesis is that you know, flavor is a guide to the micronutrients and all kinds of nutrients in uh, in the foods around us. And if you learn to train your palate and your nose, you can start to connect again um, and uh, and find these things. It's very empowering to do that. Mm, absolutely, I think I have the same. Yeah, the same feeling as well. As you say, the diversity in um, food or what we eat, basically, we need a huge diversity. We do exactly. More broadly, over the course of human history, it's estimated that we've eaten ten thousand different plant species. Right mm. now, only one hundred and fifty are cultivated for food and the same thing has happened with the diversity of animals so mm. with breeds in particular there's a huge huge loss of agrobiodiversity um, there were 8,800 breeds of livestock cultivated now you know we're, we're losing six a month at the current rate so there's this kind of giant extinction of breeds yeah. and the problem is we think that we can just back them up in gene banks mm. And gene banks are vulnerable to conflict. They're vulnerable to disasters. The great gene bank in Ukraine, I'm of Ukrainian background, um, yeah. was uh, was shelled by the Russians. And it, it held a huge number of wheat cultivars. Now they're having to move it to the western part of Ukraine to safeguard it. Same thing happened with um, uh, the wheat gene bank in Syria. And you also have to take the the germplasm out of the gene banks regularly and, mm. uh, you know, germinate them if they're plants. Yeah. And they have to be able to respond to changes in the environment. So, you know, it's a, it's a big risk. So my whole idea behind this is if you want to save something, you've got to eat it, which <laughs> sounds counterintuitive. I mean, we don't want to be eating whales and lions and tigers. They should be given the space to, to live. But, you know, in the, in the cultivated plants and animals, that's where it makes sense to seek out the more obscure breeds and, it's, yeah. uh, and, uh, and cultivars. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I want to talk about the book, because obviously it fascinates me as well, and um, you went to Cappadocia in Turkey, in uh -huh. the Anatolian plains, to find uh, the long lost extinct, supposedly extinct plant silphium, which obviously... We know from ancient Greece and Rome that it was grown in uh, modern-day Libya, in Cyrenaica, and um, apparently it was uh, being the first man-made um, <laughs> or non-man-made um, extinction of a, of, a, of a plant, of a species. But uh, what have you found? I mean, there's very intriguing things, that, um, like tantalizing stuff that <laughs> I was so glad you read about. Yes. Um, so Silphion or Silphion was this legendary plant. Uh, it is supposed to be the first recorded, I mean, in writing, uh, species extinction driven by human appetite. Silphion, as I call it, the Greek word, the Greek term, Silphium in Latin, was this, sort of the holy grail of food history. And I got a tip that a Turkish researcher at the University of Istanbul had found what he thought was a plant that answered its description. So National Geographic sent me to the center of uh, Turkey, and we, uh, a photographer came eventually, and uh, we found this plant. I'm going to call it the presumed Silphion. Mm. <laughs> it's Ferula drudiana. 
it, uh, most of our knowledge of Sylpheon comes from, of course, written descriptions, but the only images we have are from numismatics, from uh, coins, uh, from what is now Libya, Cyrenaica. But this plant really fits that description. For me, the proof was in the pudding or the eating of the pudding in this case. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, so I went to the site where it grew. It's an interesting place because it was occupied by uh, the Turkish Christian Greek community up until 1923. So it's an orchard on the flanks of an extinct volcano. This uh, Mahmut Miski, the professor who wrote the paper on it, which attracted my interest, took me there, we found the plants growing, and I returned about a year later with Sally Granger, and we went to a botanical garden in Istanbul. We had samples of the plant, stalks of Ferula drudiana, which really, really answers the description of this plant, of Sylphion. And the resin was... How fascinating. The resin was very interesting. It was, uh, it seemed to have a lot of pharmaceutically, it does have a lot of pharmaceutically interesting components. But the most fascinating thing was the intoxicating smell and eventually in cooking, the flavor. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's 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 something. How, how does it smell? What's the intoxicating thing of the smell? Well, it's, there's, I don't say, it's a little hard to describe. It's... Mm. It's very attractive. It's like there's a piney, resiny smell to it, but I'm hard pressed to describe it exactly, except it's attractive. And this, uh -huh. it, it, it attracts goats, it attracts flies, <laughs> and you feel like you, you just want to seek it out. And other Ferula species that are used in food, like Ferula asafoetida, are really pungent. They're a little off-putting. You have to get past yeah. it. So we, Sally Granger cooked with it and she did test recipes from Apicius, the great compendium of Roman recipes, as you know, using asafoetida without anything and with the presumed Sylphion. We There were a bunch of employees and students from the botanical gardens and everyone loved the one with uh, the presumed Sylphion. She made lamb, she made lentils, a number of other dishes. No flamingo. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't cook up the peacocks in the, uh, in the, that were wandering around the garden, which the Romans probably would have. But yeah, uh, yeah it, was, it, was, it was really interesting. And Sally Granger's experiments uh, with uh, this continue. She was convinced at the time the resin has to be very fresh. Mm. And it was, I think that's why it was such a sort of uh, sought after and rarefied and prestigious product mm. for the Romans. The Nero was said to have eaten the well, last stock according to Pliny. So I kind of feel like I may have been the first Westerner to <laughs> nod on the, the, uh, the resin from the root ball. <laughs> but uh, definitely the research, the more, more studies are needed, but this yeah. is, it's a very interesting thing. And the previous candidates, which are ferula species in North, that are found in North Africa or something called Mar Margotia gumifera, which grows in Spain, really might have interesting medicinal qualities, but they are of no culinary interest. Mm. And they're quite common. This is a rare plant. We only know of about uh, 600 growing in the wild in central Turkey right now. They're, oh my God. They can propagate it in, uh, with great effort in the botanical gardens using a technique called cold stratification. Anyways, I mm. I feel like yes, we have we we have found something of great interest, and uh, I I don't uh, Professor Miski's main concern is there will be a kind of a pharmaceutical gold rush, um, mm. and the plant could be extirpated from the wild. So far, that doesn't seem to have happened. Mm. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, things, exactly. uh, things get better. Yeah, your book um, and every chapter almost, you know, strands that fine balance, that uh, line between extinction and uh, pleasure and uh, how <laughs> our appetite, <laughs> how it goes between those two things. That <laughs> it's a yeah, fine balance. It is a fine balance. I don't think. I think Sylphion is uh, Sylphion is the only food stuff in the book that uh, where there's some risk of extinction. Almost everything else is cultivated, uh, not gathered from the wild. Mm. And so it's easy to sort of, you know, propagate them uh, to increase their numbers. And I'm thinking of wheat, wheat like emmer. I'm thinking of olive cultivars. I have a chapter on the millenarian 
the thousand year, 2000 year plus olive trees of Southern Italy, which are now threatened by a pathogen. Yeah. And uh, those, those things would benefit from our attention. Selfion mm. is the only one, but I had to get it in there because it's just such a great story in food history. Yeah, exactly. So what would you like the listener to get out of, I don't know, the reader out of your book, basically? Uh, what would be the central message? That you think well uh, there's one big message with two parts the first one is diversity is resilience that goes on every level it goes from the variety of foods we eat to the microbiome in our guts on a personal level to the diversity of, of living things in the soil and all mm. of that is being diminished by industry by especially by the green the 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 consequences of the green revolution. And I think there's even a tendency to diminish diversity even further and have us eating lab grown meat or, um, or, you know, other products, new forms of soylent green yeah. <laughs> um, in, uh, in order to feed the billions. I make the argument that many of those billions exist because of sort of the artificial inflation of calories brought on first by the Haber-Bosch process, um, you know, which allowed us to create artificial fertilizers, and then by the Green Revolution. So I'm making the argument that diversity is resilience. And on a personal level, you can help that process by introducing diversity into your diet by steering away from the three grains, which provide 50 to 60% of our calories, not, not avoiding them, but mm. I mean, being aware that most of your, our calories come from wheat, corn, and rice, uh, right. all of which are genetic, can be genetically modified or scientifically hybridized. I'm saying seek out whole plant foods and uh, look for obscure breeds, look for different kinds of cheeses, look for uh, add different nuts to your diet. I don't eat things that are on the brink of extinction necessarily in the wild, but look for things that might be endangered in terms of agriculture. A good guide to that is the uh, the Ark of Taste, this wonderful list compiled by the Slow Food Movement. It's available online. You can find things in your area which are on the brink of extinction but would benefit from being eaten. Mm. You can find them in your, your country or your region. So, yeah, that's, I guess that's one of the big messages. And that's, you know, uh, just in terms of health, they say that people, the latest science says that people who have 30 different plant species in their diet per week are even more likely to have optimal good health than people who follow a vegan diet. Mm. So I'm not just saying, I'm saying that it's the diversity. It's the fact. And most people get maybe 10 to 15 species for a week. Um, our diet really has become the sort of global standard diet of ultra processed foods. So look for whole plant based foods. When you do eat meat and proteins, you know, make sure it comes from ethical sources uh, that is raised in a, in a good way, in a way that enriches the soil and doesn't diminish it. Uh, I make meat an occasional treat, and I really look forward to it when I do. It might be a, some Iberico ham, for example, once a month because it's expensive, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> especially in North America, uh, but that kind of thing. And uh, you can still get a lot of your um, your protein from aquatic resources, which uh, especially smaller uh, fish. So, yeah, I mean, that, I guess that's the big takeaway in terms mm. of uh, diet. But yeah, just diversity is resilience on so many levels. Fantastic. Yeah, that sounds great. And you deliver this message with such um, an amazing adventure through history through time and also space, of course. So we go to all these different fascinating places uh, with <laughs> with you in the book, uh, which is great. Um, it, and it's so thought-provoking and so so rich in, uh, in, in imagery and um, and taste as well. I mean, I, 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 read, I read it and I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to taste this. And oh, I can imagine how that tastes. And oh, yeah, I've, I had that. And that's exactly how I imagine. Well, if I leave I you hungry, try. if I leave you hungry for more, my work is done. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, <laughs> absolutely, and um, yeah, thank you so much for coming to the Delicious Legacy podcast and your time here and your all your uh, information. Uh, when is your book um, available in UK for the listeners? It's going to be published on November 9th. Great. 
Fantastic. And um, your book, The Lost Supper, is out uh, in, in USA and Canada at the moment. It, yes, or- it, it's available. Yeah, it'll be published in French by uh, my French publisher, uh, Edition Noir Sur Blanc, in a few months. Mm, I wish you all the best because it's a really important book for everybody to read. The pleasure is mine. It was a great pleasure to meet you over the internet and in podcast land. <laughs> Thank you. And um, when you're in London, get in touch and we can go for some uh, great food and great wine. I'm sure you know exactly where to find those things. I'll yeah. be, I will be in touch. <laughs> great. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you found this uh, fascinating and um, you enjoyed the interview. Please uh, subscribe uh, to my Patreon from $3 a month where you get videos and uh, the podcast early and ad-free, plus exclusive recipes and other musings uh, by me. If you can't afford that, then uh, please, please, please leave a review and a rating for the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. You'll find the podcast on Spotify, on Acast, YouTube, Pocket Casts, and wherever else you think you can get your podcasts from. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Mm-hmm.